Hi, Kieran Brady here. I just wanted to extend my gratitude and my respect to all at the Sunderland Community Soup Kitchen. It's an incredible act of voluntary work and generosity from the people of Sunderland to help those who are most in need, particularly at this time of year. I could go on a significant rant about the fact that such benevolence should always coexist with anger that such establishments have to exist in one of the world's wealthiest countries but I will do my best to refrain and would encourage everyone around the city to do what you can to aid and assist those who are afflicted with such economic hardship. My respect to all and I wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas and a peaceful and prosperous 2021. Thank you. Hello, welcome to yet another special edition of Rocker Report, where today we are lucky enough to be speaking to a classy defender who joined Sunderland 27 years ago and went on to make 236 appearances that not only included two league titles, but spanned six years, three managers and two stadiums. Today I'm privileged to be speaking to Sunderland's most capped Welsh international, Andy Melville. Welcome, Andy. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, good to talk to you. First of all, I mean, how have you been keeping during these strange times? Yeah, obviously testing times for, for everyone. It's, it's not ideal and there's so much going on. You know I mean? You, you, how long have you got to talk what's going on in the last week <laughs> and, and stuff? Do you know what I mean? And, mm. Yeah, um, I, do, I do want to speak to you about your current role before we finish, if that's okay. But I want to get straight into your career. It takes off at your, your home down club at Swansea City in November 1985. And it's the fortnight leading up to your 17th birthday. John Bond gives you your debut in the FA Cup against Lytton Wingate, uh, followed very quickly by a league debut when you replace Colin Pascoe against Bristol City. I mean, football was a lot different back in the mid 80s. So, how tough was it being introduced as a 16 year old back then? Yeah, very tough. In fact, when I when I when I came on, uh, I, I went on as a right wing. Believe it or not, <laughs> I know people must probably can't relate too much with that. But I came on as a winger and uh, just tried to affect the game a little bit. But obviously, like you touched on, you know that them sort of years were you know mm. a lot more. Uh, if you if you made a tackle, you could get away with it. So it was a lot more physical. And uh, obviously, I was raw as a as a young kid. But really enjoyed it. Uh, I was lucky enough that John ba John Bond really trusted me and uh, thought highly of me, and uh, he gave me my opportunity. Yeah, especially at that age. I mean, uh, completely different game. But you, you touched on it there. One thing I hadn't realised until I started looking into your early career was that you were originally a centre midfielder, and, and you were actually Swansea's top scorer in the eighty eight eighty nine season, taking the mantle over from from Colin Pascoe when he moved to Sunderland the season before. So, how did you end up becoming a centre half? Yeah, no, I, th I think I, I joined. I joined as a, as a scholar and and then as a pro as a, a centre half. But I think with the youth team and eventually in the first team at the time, because of my my mobility, I could play right back and centre midfield. And this and what you touched on there, I scored fourteen goals with I scored one season. I played up front. Wow. And even then, when I played midfield, I was the one to get in the box. So when the ball was wide, I was the one to get in the box. And, and I got back, had a little bit of energy in them days. But <laughs> so I had a bit of a free roll. But uh, it was a little bit of a utility player, a little bit, especially with uh, Terry Oroth and, and a little bit with Ian Evans as well at Swansea City. Just before we leave the Swansea days, I wanted to mention that, uh, I mean, it, 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 as young as you were, 20, 21-year-old, uh, you were the skipper of the Swansea side that won the Welsh Cup, beating Kidderminsterius 5-0 in the final, which meant that you played in the UEFA Cup Winners' Cup the next season as a Division Three club, and you were drawn against Greek side Panthinaikos. Um, You scored twice in a 3-3 draw on the second leg, but unfortunately go out 6-5. I mean, that, that must have been a strange experience to play in Europe as a, as a third division club. Oh yeah, it was yeah, it was it was big big for me. He represented my local club, being a captain anyway, and obviously winning the Welsh Cup, me picking the Welsh Cup up with uh, you know people I you know I was with in school and uh, family and and the area and stuff like that. So that was real you know a real big privilege. And then obviously going into playing Panathinaikos, uh, we we went we went away and and got a decent decent uh, result and brought them back to the vet field and. Uh, we just we just sneaked out in the end. I, I scored two goals that night, and it was such a you know it was a, one of the best atmospheres I I had with Swansea City on that night, as you can imagine. And we went out. I think it was a late penalty. I think if I'm right in saying, um, 
and uh, we, we eventually uh, drew the game 3-3 and uh, th- they went through. Yeah, you said, imagine I actually took the time out to, to watch the goals today on, on YouTube. Real, real poachers goals actually on the night. Yeah, I think I was in a bit of a... Uh, a little bit of um, you know momentum, you know, score n- nicking the odd goal at times, you know, and uh, and stuff, and uh, obviously set plays. Uh, if you get the quality in the box, you know, I was used to go up for the corners and, and wide free kicks anyway, long throw. Yeah. So I, I had uh, a few opportunities to score, which was nice. Yeah, I could have done without the Greek commentary on, on the on the highlights, but uh, oh yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, also in, in 1989, around uh, two weeks before your 21st birthday, you, you make your international debut for Wales. And, and this came in a, in a qualifier for the, for the nineteen ninety World Cup in front of sixty thousand against uh, West Germany in Cologne, and you actually start the game um, and you brought off talk about Colin Pasco. Colin Pasco replaces you with ten minutes left. I mean, that must have been another huge experience at that stage of your career. Oh yeah, it was massive. Terry Orth, who was uh, who was manager at Swansea with me, obviously he knew me quite well and he trusted me and and he brought me in a squad. And uh, that night was obviously a, a massive privilege, really, to play for my country. I think uh, you know Villa, Rudy Villa was playing up front and they were flying. You know, I was thinking it was West Germany then they were flying, and I think that they qualified that night for the championships and that you know. But yeah, it was a great night, great honour. You know, something um, really happy and proud to have done. Yeah, they won two one. Volley got the first, and and Hassler got the second. Back and that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We played quite well. We played really well. Malcolm Allen scored. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, took the lead. Took the lead after eleven minutes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we played really well. We we were okay. We were pretty much in the game. Um, Franz Beckenbauer was manager, I think, of West Germany. They had a great side, and uh, you end up leaving Swansea in nineteen ninety, having uh, finished just above the relegation zone, Division Three, and you make the move to to Brian Horton's Oxford United in Division 2 and and I wanted to mention a game at Roker while you were with Oxford in February 1993 where birthday boy Mike Ford was sent off for a handball on the goal line except it wasn't Mike Ford at all can you remember how you managed to get away with that one? <laughs> I don't know how they knew if I got away with it no it just uh... <laughs> I still speak to uh, Mike Ford, Fordy now quite a lot, and uh, if we ever get together or if we chat, and we, we we still mention it now, and he gives me stick any chance of me owning up, but he's no chance of doing that. I don't think any anybody would do that, but uh, yeah, no, I don't know. I got away with it, just obviously a big mistake by the officials. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You you got a one man match ban later on though, didn't you? But, yeah, uh, I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. You yeah. Stayed on the pitch. They caught up with me in the end. Yeah. <laughs> well, four months after that, uh, in the summer of nineteen ninety three, you find yourself in demand, and you're wanted by Dave Bassett's Sheffield United side here in the the Premier League at this point. But uh, Terry Butcher manages to convince you to sign for Sunderland in a deal worth uh, four hundred and fifty thousand plus Anton Rogan moving in the opposite direction. I mean, was that a tough decision to turn down Premier League football at that point in your career? Uh, yeah, it was, but the size, um, the size of uh, Sunderland's football club and Terry Butcher was a big factor on being a centre half. You know, played against his sides, you know, in the past, and uh, we always acknowledged each other, sort of thing, when we played against each other. And uh, it was, I think it was a, you know, a mutual respect there. But yeah, you know, it was. Uh, it's obviously difficult at the time. You, you know, the decision I made was obviously, you know, one of the best I've made, you know, right through my football career because I absolutely love my time up there. So, um, yeah, Terry Butcher was a big say on it, definitely at the time. Yeah. I mean, it, it was strange for Sunderland because we actually splashed the cash that summer and, and you signed at the same time as uh, Alec Chamberlain, Phil Gray, Derek Ferguson and, and Ian Rogerson. And we're looking good a week from the start of the season as we beat Middlesbrough in a pre-season friendly. Uh, and then you, along with the other signings, except Alec Chamberlain, you're involved in a pretty serious car crash where... Out of those involved uh, in the accident, uh, only you go on to play the whole 90 minutes of the opening game a week later against Derby County. Uh, I'm pretty sure Derek Ferguson only managed 20 minutes, but I mean, were you fully recovered by that Derby County game? Because it was a pretty serious collision. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> the way I must probably, the fans must probably see me on the day we, we, we lost, but um, it was, um, you know, at the time you, you, you think you're okay and you think you're mentally okay and and uh, you know it was, it was obviously a big crash and you know Ian Rogerson broke uh, I think he uh, he was out for three months um, Phil Gray was pulling gla- uh, pieces of glass out of his air weeks and months later so it affected us all in different ways but um, obviously played in the game bit of a bit of a shock bit of a shock and you know and not nice we were coming back and driving back to Durham at the time from Roker Park really full of beans really Mm. Really full of beans and happy and stuff and uh, it was a big blow for us and um, really I think uh, Derek's career really didn't really didn't go I'm not saying it was because of that but it didn't really 
go where it should have gone. And obviously, in Rogerson uh, being out for three months, it was a massive blow for him. But um, yeah, yeah, I would say I'd, I'd recovered. You know, you, you know, it's different now. You must probably would get tested completely different now with 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 the people around you. At, you know, every football club. But uh, it was just like a. For me, it was just like a short little checkup, seeing it was okay and everything was fine at the time. Yeah, well, we spoke to a few of the players who played alongside Terry Butcher before he came manager, as he was kind of a player for Sunderland for a season before. And they, they, some of them said it was a strange transition when he stopped becoming a player and then moved into the, the manager role. I mean, yeah. how, how did you find the atmosphere in the squad when you joined? Yeah, it, it, the atmosphere was good because you, Gary Owers, you, Richard Ord, Tony Norman, and all them boys were there. So they were a little bit, you know, the the, the old crowd, if you like. So they they made it, they made us all welcome. But then obviously we're then bringing this, you know, a lot more sort of players in. Sometimes it does take a while to knit together, and obviously it di- it, it didn't really knit together at the time. But um, we eventually got there further down the line. <laughs> now you know, you know, if you've been in the football world for a while, I have, and sometimes bringing too many players in in the same window, mm. you know, does confuse it because it takes a while to get partnerships and units working well together. So, um, yeah. you know, but but the atmosphere was fine. I felt it was, I felt it was okay. You know, I'm the one. I'm quite a laid back guy anyway. Personality to to just get on with people and and not and not over analyze things anyway. You know, so I just walked in. I knew T- Tony Norman from the Welsh squad anyway, so he made me feel welcome. Obviously, Colin Pascoe was floating about as well, mm, yeah. and um, so I, I I knew plenty of um, uh, faces there anyway. You know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Colin Pasco kind of passed you on the way as you were coming in. I think he yeah. went out to Swansea, I think. I, in fact, I rented his house out <laughs> with, uh, yeah, my, my missus. Yeah, I rented his house out. He went uh, he went off and I, and I came up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, as you said, I mean, it didn't quite work and we, we struggled the first half of that season. And after a run of straight, six, uh, six straight defeats, uh, we were 20th in, in the league and Terry Butcher was sacked in the November. I mean, you've just mentioned he was a big part of you signing. So were you disappointed that he was sacked so early on or, or within the squad did you get a feeling that the writing's on the wall yeah a little bit obviously you know you know as you just the same before results you know it's a results business and um i'm sure i'm sure it you know we he, he believed he believed that we would turn the corner but um you know, sometimes come to a head and people got to make decisions you know as i touched on before perhaps um we didn't uh, knit together as a as a squad or as a team uh, at the time a little bit disappointed obviously because he he brought me to the football club you know and um you have to appreciate that i love my time up there six years or some great times as you mentioned before i'm sure we speak on it further down the line but um so i got a lot to thank him about anyway you know yeah yeah well actually in that november just to move away from Sunderland for a minute but you're on uh, international duty again for wales as usual and, and you start in that vital probably now famous game against romania where a win at cardiff's um, cardiff arms park they'll send you through to the world cup in the usa in, in the following year um and a lot was made of kind of paul Porden's missed penalty as the game is uh, poised at 1-1 um but there's a, a mistake from south all in that game and you probably had enough chances to win before going down 2-1 but I mean, would you say that's the biggest disappointment of your career that night? Yeah, it was. Uh, well, it was a, obviously a game against Russia, which we might have touched on later as well in the playoffs. But uh, yeah, it was a massive one because, uh, like you said, so, sometimes with Wales, we we sort of used to r- r- ride our luck a little bit in games. But this game, this game, we had enough opportunities and we played well and we deserved to sort of win the game, if you like. So obviously, icing on the cake was was Paul Borden's miss uh, to you know to take us, you know to take us. Through so it was, yeah, it was a big, big, big disappointment, and uh, you know that them them sort of because of the obviously you're playing for your country and you're nearly there. You know it does really take the stuffing out of you. You know and you don't realise at the time, but when you when you analyse and you look back uh, through your career on certain things, you look back and you think that did really take the stuffing out of me because it was obviously a big, massive night for for the country. You know. Yeah, good team Romania. They had some good players that night. Uh... 
Hadji, I think, scored one, didn't he? And well, he scored the one where slipped under Southall. So. Yeah, yeah, and that you know, he talk about never Southall. You can talk about him all, all night long for being, yeah. you know, being the world. He was probably the best in the world, you know, yeah. in a period of time when he was flying for Wales and New uh, and and for Everton and in a big game like that, you know, he he sort of makes that mistake. But to be honest with you, he must probably got us to that position anyway, you know, in the first in the first place. So. I think yeah, I think Sunderland fans knew he was good because he he kept Tony Norman out the well side, didn't he? So he, he must have been good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, going back to Sunderland, uh, Mick Buxton, who was the reserve team manager, takes charge, and he seems to make us uh, a lot more difficult uh, to beat and visibly more organised. And we we kind of pick up to finish twelfth that year. I mean, did he start to ring the changes straight away? Because there seemed to be a huge improvement that year. Yeah, with, with Mick, he was very, very like um, you know. You look at my managers how they prepare now, and and um, some of the managers that I did like ten, fifteen years, who, who, who I work with, and and he was ahead of his time, really. You know, he got us properly every Friday. We would spend twenty, thirty minutes on the opposition, knowing exactly what what we were up against. You know, and uh, some would say, you know, so it would be an argument out there. They would say that's too long to spend on the opposition, but it was the first time really that I sort of analysed and got to know who I was playing against. You know, if somebody was like good in the air, if somebody run uh, a channel, or somebody was left or right footed. You know, we, we got all that information, and uh, yeah, I used to enjoy the meetings to be honest, because he used to he used to um, <clears throat> get all the players involved. So, for example, if you play against Oxford, my ex side, he would like say, "Oh, you." Uh, describe that sort of player and we have a little bit of banter with it so I quite I quite enjoyed it but he did get us organised yeah and, and more or less uh, you know harder to get beat as well definitely mm. Chris yeah Do you think w- with some of those meetings you're saying it's ahead of its time really and y- you were obviously adapting to it but do you think there was maybe some of the the ones from the oldest girl who thought, mm, you know, a, a half an hour meeting talking about the opposition was a bit strange. Yeah, yeah, you, could, you know, it's, 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 you could even talk about that now, you know what I mean? It's like my big mate Chris Wilder's at Sheffield United and he, mm. he done that when I was five years coach at Oxford United with him. Do you know mm. what I mean? So, mm. and, I, and I'm sure he won't be for a million miles off doing that at Sheffield United now. You know, but to me, it didn't like it when when it was thirty minutes. It didn't feel like thirty minutes. Do you know what I mean? Because it was a bit of a bant and it was a bit of crack in there for me personally. But again, if you got uh, your old heads, you know, and coming to the end of your career, you know, they might they might think a little bit different and and explain it a little bit different to you. But yeah, I was okay with it to be fair. Yeah, personally. Yeah. But it's a it's a similar story. <laughs> the following season, when uh, Mick Buxton is sacked. Um, we find ourselves in a relegation battle of seven games left and uh, we go out and appoint uh, Peter Reid as our new manager. I mean, this is the third manager in less than two years uh, and even this early on in your time at Sunderland. Was that a breath of fresh air when Peter Reid arrived at the club? Yeah, he came, he came in straight away and put his stamp on it, and um, he was it was nowhere to go really. It was it was literally like I'm going I'm going on a bus trip. You're either coming with us or, or you're not coming with us. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was as simple as that really. It was quite straightforward. He just livened the place up. Uh, told told you how it was, and um, obviously uh, you know obviously he's he's an absolutely um, legend up there for what he's done over the years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean yeah, there were some tense uh, tense moments in those. Seven games when he when he took over, um, but yeah, I mean, and, and then uh, ahead of his uh, first full season in charge, he only really adds Paul Bracewell and and John Mullen in terms of new players uh, during that summer. Um, yeah. But it's it's clear as we kind of start that new season that we've we've have a new style that means we kind of play from the back a lot more. I mean, was that something that Peter Reid and Bobby Saxon worked on that summer? And do you think it brought the best out in you because you were a centre half who was a, a you know pretty comfortable on the ball. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think uh, you know Bob Bobby Saxton. To be honest, Bobby Saxton is most probably the best best coach that I've worked with, positioning wise. I learned so much, so much from him. Getting in, in in certain positions, defending when the ball was one side, you shuffle across. So Bobby was absolutely brilliant for me. Um, and he and he knew he, and he knew the game inside out, and uh, we had a really good relationship. So um, yeah, Bobby, I was a big say in it, obviously as well with with, with Peter Reid. So they bounced off each other. And and that year we we start to to build momentum, especially around Christmas, uh, to go from relegation candidates the season before uh, to go on and and quite incredibly win the title that season. I mean, how much of that league title was down to? I mean, but you mentioned it there a little bit, but the, the team spirit that Peter Reid, with the help of Bobby Saxon, had created. 
Yeah, massive. I think the team spirit and the organisation and, uh, you know, the personality and grittiness really that season more than more than when we when we won the title after that we um, we weren't scoring bags of goals we rode our luck at certain times that season I would say um, you know uh, nick it nick in results but I think for our, our literally hard work determination organization we deserved it because I don't am I right in saying we didn't really have a lot of points that season yeah, we had. Uh, it was one of those seasons. <laughs> we ground uh, ground the results out. We had, we had by far the best defensive record in the league. We only conceded ten at home all season. Incredible. Yeah, no, no, it was good. Yeah, well, it's just, it's like me going back to to units and uh, little partnerships. You know, they they just we started together and get units. You know, um, four four two four four one one as we called it in them days, and we was organised. We all, all knew what we were doing, and uh, we were strong all over all over the park, really. But I think you know we weren't scoring bags and bags of goals that season. For, you know, Kev Phillips and Nal Quinn wasn't inside that. You know that that was early. We were like a lot more, lot more solid and um, organised in, in, in uh, defensively. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Craig Russell was top scorer on thirteen, which for for a title win inside tells you a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it, that's what it was. You know, you, we were nicking one nil away from home with a set play, for example. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But it's always is all different ways of winning games, as you know. Mm. You know, you can be in total domination and lose the game, but it was it's all about results. But we found a way. We found a way that mm. season for you know, obviously defensive record was good, but we we found a way of n- n- nicking results away from home and. Um, and get momentum and uh, and plenty of confidence as we went along. Yeah, because you, you mentioned partnerships. I mean, that season you and you and Richard all at the back. I mean, uh, you were both comfortable on the ball, and everything just seemed to start with you two, and it started from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, me and Audie had a really good partnership. We got him well off the pitch as well, which was good. So uh, we we bounced off each other. We both trusted each other with and without the ball. And, uh, we, we worked really well together and got a lot of time for Richard Audia, yeah, definitely. We, he, and what a player he was, by the way. He was so yeah. underrated, so underrated. And he had a left foot. He was like a wand, his left foot, yeah. yeah. It was a shame when uh, he had that nasty kind of back injury in the end, doesn't it? <laughs> definitely, yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, you had a, I mean, because it was a couple of, Tough years, really, at Sunderland. You know, they hadn't gone, you know, great. Just you know, in terms, just generally with the club. But um, I mean, that that day when you picked up the the championship at uh, at Roker Park must have been pretty special. Yeah, yeah, it was special. And he t- he touched on the uh, on the tough times, and um, uh, you know, and me personally, to be honest with you, in 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 um, with their managers, I wasn't flying and playing great myself, to be honest with you, and. And um, the crowd were getting on my back a little bit, and uh, hopefully, I think I won them over in the end. But I, th- and to be honest, it was one of them where I sort of um, had to get myself mentally really strong, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, looking back, you know, um, it was uh, it was sink or swim at the time, and um, mm-hmm. I had to be a lot more positive in, in the way I went about it personally as well. Mm-hmm. And obviously, I came through it, and uh, and 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 had a great relationship, working relationship with uh, Richard Orden, and went on went on to uh, to win the title. But yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was uh, the memories of uh, of winning it, and you know, is uh, you know the fans deserve it because they obviously had a you know a, ba- a few bad years, and um, it was great to uh, to lift it for that for them people because. Um, you know, uh, I got a lot of time from the a little bit similar from my background uh, back in Swansea. You know, working class. You know, down to earth, humble people. So uh, I could relate to a lot of them as well. Yeah. Yeah, and and of course you now Premier League player, and and there's there's always talk of the jump in class when you make that step up. But but how did you find that step up kind of 24 years ago? Yeah, no, I I I, I thought um, I I thought I sort of. Um, you know, went into it okay. Um, it was a lot of question marks over my pace, but what I touched on with with Bobby Saxton positionally, he sorted that out for me, and and, and that was a big help. So, um, so I always say that my somebody like myself, the way the attributes I got, you have to be one step ahead of the centre forward or, or the winger or the attacker. So um, 
you know I thought that I was learning that through Bobby over the years and uh, obviously I, I played a few games by the time I got to, to the Premiership anyway so I was pretty experienced and uh, yeah I, th- I, I thought I was okay comfortable with it but obviously you know pace wise you know you are, you are stepping up a gear another another level or levels if you like with the top boys but um mm. Yeah, I thought I took two. I was just disappointed that um, I got injured um, mm-hmm. and I missed the last 10 games. And uh, I just looked back and just, you know, wish I was involved because I do believe, to be honest with you, I would have had a bit of an impact on it and uh, we might have survived, you know. Yeah, we were unlucky, really. 40 points. We certainly held our own. And actually, at, at home, we only conceded one more goal than Manchester United, who, who won the title, which tells you a lot. Yeah, I know, and uh, you know, and you know, you, and then look, you, you you might look back, and obviously, you know, and look at that side of it, and I didn't realise that myself until you just told me there, Chris, and you think mm-hmm. like, should we have done a little bit sort of different style of playing away from home? Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. For example, but you know, you look back, and and Peter Reid, you know, might think we didn't have the personality or the, or the players or the or the or the squad to do that at the time, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, and losing Tony Corton and now Quinn as well. I mean, that, that must have been big blows that season. Yeah, big blows, you know, obviously big personalities, uh, even even though they're around the place, but you want them on the football pitch, obviously, for, you know, for quality and personality and leaders. And uh, and obviously, uh, you know, they, they, they're, class, uh, they're class footballers. So, uh, yeah, it was a big blow. And obviously, you know, we might... might the luck most probably wasn't with us where mm. the season before we might have had a little bit of, bit of luck, you know, with, with injuries and certain things going our way. So, uh, but to go down on 40 points, you know, I don't think that, that, that that's happened uh, very often. No, I think I think we were the first as usual. Yeah. Yeah. Typical Sunderland start there. Yeah, um, yeah. But we, obviously we, we do end up getting relegated and that summer we start a rebuild of the likes of, you've mentioned Kevin Phillips already, Chris Makin, Lee Clark, Jody Craddock. And we're also making the move to the to the new stadium as well. But I mean, at the start of the season, we we lose three of the first four league games, and we don't have the best of starts. And then it, it kind of you know rolls on a little bit. We get beat four 0 at Elm Park against Redden, and then Peter Reid rings the changes after this in in the back four. And I think um, from memory, you and Richard Ord had been playing with Knox, if I remember rightly. And then I mean, did Peter Reid have a conversation with you that he needed to change things, or, or was that not his style? No, I wasn't his style to be honest. No, he just he just cracked on with it. He just cracked on with it. And um sometimes every every manager does it different than they, you know, and um he did it that way, which which was fine. Obviously he thought that we weren't we weren't uh, producing and uh, he had to make a big decision and uh, obviously he did, so I was obviously disappointed at the time, but um you know, we're big enough and strong enough to to get through that and uh it's not all about us or me and Richard Ord, it's about the squad and the football club, you know, so we had to deal with it at the time. Yeah, I mean, because we played out pretty much the majority of the season with, with Jody Craddock and Darren Williams and then the centre of defence and went on to lose only three of the next 36 league games. So, I mean, how difficult yeah. is that that scenario when you can't really knock on the manager's door and argue to get back in? That, that must be difficult. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's... It is difficult, frustrating because you train, you train all week, and it, and it wasn't a lot, a lot to look forward to on the weekend, you know. And uh, every player wants to play out there, but um, it's all ups and downs of football and and in life, not just football. But uh, they weren't great times um, personally, but uh, I had to get on with it, train hard, keep myself right, because obviously I uh, wanted to keep the international stuff, you know, going as well. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but uh, you know. Fair play to to the guys that got in. They did well and um, and they produced and uh, they were good for the football club as well. Yeah, I mean, was um, I mean, obviously you've talked about Bobby Saxon's character, but I mean, alongside Peter Reid, were they good at keeping people involved who weren't necessarily starting every week? Yeah, Bobby did that. Bobby was good. Bobby, you know, Bobby was uh, was. Uh, this sort of um, the the link, if you like, on that side of it, where I think sometimes. Um, managers need to dip in dip out you know which 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 i get which i would do if i was ever a manager but i wouldn't do it but if i I get it completely get it because they have to be there's they're at the top of the tree and you know i've been on the coaching staff and i sometimes used to do that as a first team coach um at oxford united where the manager would say you know sort of keep him happy for the for the next couple of weeks because i'm not going to play him so you have to do the job right sort of thing <laughs> i mean so so i so i got it and um 
And uh, yeah, but he was he's still out because you want to play football. But um, you know, Bobby helped us out and said, you know, just hang in there, work hard, and uh, your time will come again. You know. Yeah, and, and actually during that season, I mean, you, you end up moving to Bradford City on loan. Was that purely to get game time and match fitness, or, or were you actually considering that you might have to make a move? No, I, I wasn't considering no making a move. To be honest with you, I just need to play football. Just need to go out and play mm. football, and obviously, I wasn't getting much of a look in, uh, and it was just uh, just an opportunity. And sometimes, uh, well, I, I'm a big believer in if if a football club or if a manager comes to you and says there's a move here, would you fancy it? I think he's already more or less made your mind up sort of thing, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? So I think it was the right thing uh, for me to do uh, at the time, uh, just to get some uh, minutes underneath my belt, yeah. Yeah, and well, we miss out on promotion through the playoffs and, and we need to go again the following year. But uh, what what was your thinking that summer in terms of your, your future? Because we also added Paul Butler to the squad and you were going into the last year of your contract as well. So I mean, yeah. were you having thoughts that summer? Do you know what, Chris? I was I wasn't because I think it's different now. But I was I was contracted to the football club, and this would be any football club that I was at. Never ever asked for a move. Never never really mourned. Never literally would knock on uh, knock on somebody's door because mm. I would just literally get on with it. And sometimes I might have shot myself in the foot. Sometimes you have to give the manager and the coaches a little nudge. But I I just respected the decision and just got on with it. But that summer, to be honest with you, that summer the hardest I've ever worked. And when I come back for pre-season, it's probably the fittest I've ever been. Yeah. I just thought I took everything personal out of it because sometimes you can get personal with uh, with uh, managers. And I just thought, what can I affect? And I got myself fitter, stronger, mentally, physically, whatever you want to call it, come back, walk through the door. I was up for it. I was up for mm. a battle. Did any of what happened the season before, because obviously I mean, the <laughs> that the momentum during that that season before when you weren't getting in in the team, but I mean that the, the stadium was bouncing, the football we were playing was was superb. I mean, did, did was that motivation as well to get back in? You yeah, to be part of that. You know the atmosphere. You know the stadium light when it's full and it's buzzing up and running and everything's going well. There's no better place to be. Mm. You know, in in my world, you know, yeah, you you. <laughs> Supporters were turning up in their numbers, and it was a buzz around the place, and uh, it was uh, it was good to see. I was sort of part of it, but I wanted to be more part of it. So it was a it was a motivation for me. It was a motivation for me as well. And obviously, um, I got through it. I got through it and come out the other side again. You know. Yeah, because as we start that next season, I mean, you're not in the starting lineup against Queens Park Rangers on the opening day, but then. You get your chance, uh, I think, through an injury to, to Jordy Craddock and you go on to form an incredible partnership with Paul Butler where you both end up playing 44 of the 46 league games and you actually play 52 games in all competitions that season as we broke all kinds of records, in, including finishing on 105 points. I mean, I, I imagine that team was just a joy to play in. Uh, I was like, it's something that I've been involved in two sides, one at Fulham and, and one at Sunderland, where... You just like he looked around in that changing room, and he's just so much quality, class, personality, and you just think his goals in the side, he was character in the side, he was all we was organised, you know, we had everything covered, we had everything covered, and you mentioned that you know playing out from the back, we just had an unbelievable outlet, we just had an unbelievable outlet if we were ever in trouble we had diagonal up to Quinny and he, everybody knows what <laughs> Al Quinn's all about you know he's just like nobody can get around him he was bringing down his chest he was flicking in for Kevin and their partnership was ridiculous you know they had something and the fine details that they used to say to each other and they simple fine details but the stuff they were doing, they just knew where he was going to edit, knew knew whatever you you know where they were running. They were just special. They were just mm. special. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I mentioned. Uh, I mean, you played forty four games, but actually there was only Tommy Sorensen who who played more league games than than you and Paul Butler. And then after that, it was Kevin Ball. So I mean, obviously, there's a lot of emphasis on the attacking players during that season. And I mean, that was great to watch as a fan. But the partnership, as we mentioned with you and Paul Butler that season, was the foundation that everything was built on. And I think the way we played again suited the, you know, how comfortable you were in possession. And you seemed to be that point person, maybe more than maybe more than Paul Butler. You had your defined roles. I mean, did you work on that or did that just come naturally? 
Yeah, it comes natural. I think, um, you know, you, you can work on it in training and you can talk about it. But the bottom line is you need to go out there and play and experience it together sort of thing. And we, we knitted together quite nice. We got on really well. So it was a similar relationship off the pitch with uh, Richard Orders with Butts. Um, we really got on well. And uh, as a partnership, we got, we rubbed off on each other. We used to help each other. We give each other information. If a, if a centre forward was quick and he used to run in behind, we would let each other know. It wasn't an individual relationship. It wasn't one of them. I just going to go in a team and just get on with it. You know, we worked hard together as a pair and obviously as a as a as a unit as well with the back four. But um, yeah, it, it, it obviously after the the summer I had the mentality I come back stronger. It was just I was so positive in myself in what I was doing. You know, I was gonna I was giving myself every single opportunity when I came on for Jordy Craddock and obviously. Um, I played all them games, which is like an unbelievable experience for me personally. Yeah, and I also wanted to mention that season because we were we were pretty close. We um we got to the League Cup semi final against Leicester. Yeah, with how you know that we were playing that year because we were flying. I mean, that must have actually been a disappointment that we didn't make the final that season. It was, yeah. I think we were so so much full of confidence and momentum. It was we fancied ourselves. We we was absolutely gutted. We was absolutely gutted because I think uh, in a little bit inside we thought we were going to do it, you know. So yeah, it was really really massive disappointment. I mean, we mentioned as well. I mean, all this was going on. You're absolutely flying. Club was flying. But we mentioned it's the last year of your contract. Were there any conversations throughout that season about signing a new contract or being offered a new contract? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. We just got on with it. And and again, I'm I'm one of them. Again, it's it would be changing now because an agent would be knocking on the door asking for a new contract. But I just sort of got got on with it, and I've just focused on my football. And uh, I I've always. You know, let that uh, let that take care of itself, really. And uh, the talks weren't until until the summer. So they started talking to you when the summer came. Summer, yeah, after the season finished, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think was it a one year deal you were offered? Yeah, I was offered a one year deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just um, you know, I had six unbelievable years, mm. and it was just come to a point where I was thirty, mm. uh, and I had a, a, a young family, and. Um, the length of the contract wasn't appealing enough at the time, and I obviously had to keep my keep my options open. And did did, did any of that kind of take it, you know the shine off uh, that title season? Or uh, just just obviously disappointing because I wanted I, the bottom line. I did want to stay at the football club. Um, now I might that might sound a bit of a contradiction because I was offered a, I was I was offered a contract by the football club, but again you have to look at the, the the package of it the package of it where i just thought that i was fit still strong enough i wanted deteriorating i was going i i thought mentally physically i was going on for you know strength to strength and um some when they get to 29 30 31 they sort of start losing certain things where i mm-hmm. think i was um gaining things and uh, and getting advantage on people because just because of my work ethic and and uh, the way the way I looked after myself. So um, yeah, I was obviously disappointed to go, but one one in the end, I thought I had to make. Mm. Yeah, and as you said, I mean you're 30 years old, uh, come on, come off the back of that amazing season, and you're free to talk with any club as a free agent. And uh, Paul Bracewell, who's in charge at Fulham. Uh, at the time, someone obviously you knew from Sunderland, um, yeah. persuaded you to make the move to, to London. I mean, h- how much of that was was that it was Paul Bracewell at Fulham? Yeah, obviously Brace played with Brace, and 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 he was a coach of Sunderland, and he knew what I was all about. When I found out that he got the job, he was literally for, you know straight on the phone, which. Sometimes it's just a little bit of trust and he, he relied on me, he knew what I was about and it was all to do with him really because I had other choices as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously the length of the contract helped as well. Um, it was a three-year contract. Um, so that was a little bit of security for me, you know, for my family and that side of it. To be honest with you, I, I ended up having successful years there as well in the, in the championship and premiership after that, yeah. So there were other offers on the table to consider that summer, not just Fulham? Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's quite a few, in fact, yeah. 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 
I mean, you, you went on to, to make over 150 appearances for Fulham and, and a lot of which are, are in the Premier League, which kind of you know, makes a little bit of a mockery of the, the one-year deal that you were offered at Sunderland. You spent five years there under the likes of John Tigana uh, and, and Chris Coleman, actually. And, and on the subject of Chris Coleman, um, I mean, you, you both went all, you go all the way back to the Swansea days and you played together there. Um, yeah. You were in the same team that lifted that World's Cup that were mentioned as well. I mean, is that, is that another strange scenario when someone you know well takes over as manager? Yeah, it, it was it was strange because uh, I used to pick Chris up every morning uh, when I was at Swansea. He was a bit younger than me, Chris, two years younger mm. than me. And uh, I used to pick him up. Uh, I used to wait 20, 30 minutes every, every morning for him. <laughs> I used to pick him up. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, it was difficult. It, it's, it's, it's one of them. When you're playing, when you're playing, and he's the manager of the football club, everything's fine. But he had to make a couple of decisions on me further down the line. Um, it's never, it's never, we've never fallen out with it. It's, uh, we've always been respectful. We're still going well today, you know. But uh, you know, once he had to leave me out the side, and we're literally nearly both in tears. We're nearly both in tears, and like mm-hmm. can hardly speak to each other. And mm-hmm. he was leaving me out of the, of the game, and I was getting more emotional being left out. And I should have been like. Tamping, but because of our relationship, we were just we were just like so ready to like cry, really, if you like, because it was so difficult. I knew how difficult it was for him to leave me out, you know. Uh, but when he fir- when he first took over, it was fine because uh, we still we still talked really a little bit, you know. Uh, you know, he'd call me and stuff and things like that because I was captain of the football club anyway, so he would call me and uh, and sort of pick my brains as well and stuff. So uh, you know, it, it, it was fine at first, but obviously further down the line, it was it was difficult when when he did have to leave me out. Yeah, I'm sure those Swansea stories would have been brought up if he tried to find you for being late or, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even like used to sort him all the tickets out and all that. Be soon forgotten, isn't it? And you're like, can't, you can't you play me in the Premiership just because I give you tickets and I used to pick you up every morning? But... Short memories. Yeah. Um, did he ever sound you out about uh, taking the job on? Uh, yeah, he did. And uh, what he had at the football club was uh, a group of older pros who run the dressing room. And he knew that. And he knew that. And he knew he could count on us and trust us. And so him going into that job, you know, he was quite lucky. He was quite lucky because he had people that if there's any younger boys who wouldn't train hard or, or were a little bit of, um, uh, or needed a little bit more maintaining, the the experienced players would, would, would put, us, put an end to it. So mm-hmm. that, took, that took a little bit of the management out of it where he could have been a little bit sort of not, not popular because... Mm-hmm. Me, Lee Clark, um, Kit Simons, them sort of characters would would put it to bed, sort of thing. So he was lucky, but he took to it. He took to it so well. Um, you know, once so young, uh, he he monitored John T. Garner for for a for a couple of months before. Um, he used to stand at the training ground taking notes. So he was really like a student of the game as soon as he got into it, really. Yeah. Were you ever in a position to to give him any advice on whether or not to to go to Sunderland? No, do you know what he didn't? He didn't ring me. He didn't ring me, and I was I seen. I tell you what, I seen it on Sky Sports, and <laughs> uh, and I messaged him the time the time that I seen it. I messaged him. I said, "Is not is no and it's, there's no word of lie." I said, "Is no better place. There's no better place in football. If you get that club rocking and rolling, up and running." You be you know he is no better place to be in football because obviously I can only go by my experience, Chris. When I was at Stadium of Light, when we we're in front of forty six thousand at every home game, guaranteed, you know, and the place was packed out in the atmosphere, and we were winning games, and you know that championship year was was unique, you know, and I can only go off that experience, and uh, you know, and that's what I said to him. That's what I said to him. Yeah, he's no better place to be. I've said this before, but um, it was the only time in my Sunderland support and lifespan where I've, I've gone to the stadium just wondering how many were going to win by. And, and a lot of that was, was kind of fueled by the momentum of, of the stadium and being packed out. And, and I thought, you know, as you've said, I think I'm sure the players kind of <laughs> relished playing in, a, in, a, in an environment like that. Oh, yeah, it was um, like, I think I touched on it when I, I don't think I, um, I give it too much detail, but... I think we lost three games that championship year when we went up the second time, Peter Reid. Mm. I think it was three games that we lost, but it was just one of those when right. you're having a pre-match meal or if you're or if you're getting ready at home in the morning, you just had the feeling that 
three points today. It was it was like it was a bit weird. He just thought <laughs> like yeah, we'd be all right today, we could get three points. Do you know what I mean? He was but you obviously had to work hard and do the tactics and do this and do that. It was loads of stuff that you had to do, but you just had that feeling. Well, I had that feeling in myself and I'm sure that the other lads had the same because we had so much quality and, and determinations and character wise you know, in the squad and in the team. You finished your career with spells uh, with West Ham United, Nottingham Forest, before you retired in 2005. Was that a conscious decision at that point to stop or, or you know, rather than drop down the legs? Or did you have any injuries at that point? Yeah, t- I, when I went to West Ham, it, it just didn't... Um... It just didn't click, and and me and Alan Pardew, we didn't we didn't really like we clashed a little bit at times, um, which happens, which happens is not not no big deal. It happens, mm. and uh, it's just stuff that he said to me before he signed me. Didn't really carry it through, if you like, uh, but then things happened, and it, I just thought a little bit. Uh, my spring went a little bit. I still had the desire. I still had the desire, but. Uh, I think it was a stage where I think a lot of a lot of uh, ex players and a lot of players will say your mind knows where the ball's going, but your legs your legs don't get there, and it's horrible. And if I said that to some players now, they go, "Yeah, Andy, what are you talking about?" But it will, <laughs> it will happen, and it's not a good feeling. And because I I thought one of my big biggest attributes was reading the game, and. I could read the game in my mind, but then my 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 foot my feet weren't doing it, so it wasn't it wasn't great. But when I finished that for uh, sorry at West Ham, I sort of had a had a couple of chats with Oxygen and I had a couple of chats with uh, with Wickham, but they just didn't materialise on both sides really. Yeah, and and you make the transition uh, into becoming a coach, and you become first team coach, and, and then assistant manager to Chris Wilder, which you touched on at, at Oxford United. I mean. I've seen one or two players talk about some of Chris Wilder's early managerial positions, about how detailed he was, whatever level he managed at. I mean, is that how you find him when when you were at Oxford? Yeah, he was so organised uh, in everything he did. And uh, it was good for me to see. It was good for me to see and observe. And obviously, I uh, don't know everything in football and experienced different things. And I know quite a lot, but the stuff that he did was different. Stuff that... The information that you give the players, they knew what they were doing with the ball, without the ball. They knew everything about the opposition. They knew what environment environment they were going into. So he just prepared them mentally um, as well, you know, in, in, in everything really. So he was very, very thorough. But then, then you actually make a move into more of the recruitment side and you're appointed into roles of either recruitment scout or head of recruitment at Birmingham City, Blackpool, Portsmouth, and then back with Chris Wilder at North, Northampton Town. Um, and you're now a consultant with Red Six Sports Management. So, so what does that role involve? Football agent, really, to be honest with you. We're Red Six Sports Management. We're, we're um, not one of the, um, the the big boys, but we're sort of in the second tier, if you like, of... Uh, <laughs> of agencies uh, we're well run very well structured we've got uh, we have got championship and league one players in there um, we've got a lot of uh, Welsh uh, internationals Welsh internationals England internationals so um, we've got a lot of potential um, further down the line so we, we're going really good in the right direction and uh, I'm very excited about it I've really really enjoyed it I think I can affect uh, players because that, like you mentioned I've had all roles at the football club playing coaching recruitment so I can relate to a lot of things i.e. recruitment meetings um, managers assistant managers first team coach when they're having meetings when they're picking a side so um, I'm, getting, I'm getting players prepared for that side of it um, obviously done a lot of a uh, lot of deals with when I was at Northampton Town for two and a half years as head of recruitment I used to uh, me and the chief executive executive was uh, in charge of the budget so I knew what players were earning and what they were on and part of the big uh, the deal. So I was very, very sort of um, right into it. Um, I used to take the deal to about 90% and then the chief is actually to take over with, with, with the agent in then days. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so I think I've got uh, all different roles and experience to, to, to add to, to each player that I manage yeah, in the company. 
recent events had any impact or have you been able to get through it um, with the technology? Yeah, it's been challenging and it's been unique, obviously, what's, you know, what's, what's happened to so that's It's been difficult to advise players because you haven't experienced this side of it as well. But obviously, being in the game for 34 years, you just try and um, just, just let them know what, what experience you've had or close to, to experience you've had in the past, but never never experienced this this sort of uh, mm. stuff ever, really. <laughs> yeah, I um, don't think anybody else. But um, do you get a chance to visit this stadium a lot in your current role or, or even for a non-work-related trip? No, I haven't been to a game. In the mm-hmm. stadium of lights since 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 I left, to be honest. No, I've been up I've been up to the training ground a couple of times. Um, yeah, to uh, to see Kevin Ball and uh, to watch a couple of uh, under twenty three games. Mm-hmm. But uh, I am been back to the stadium of light to be honest for for the game. But I'd like to one day. Yeah, it'd be nice to go back. Um, I'm threatening to. Um, <laughs> I will go back one day. Hopefully, hopefully it's going to be in uh, one of the top two divisions. That's where that's where I'm. Uh, that's where I'm hoping. You know, someone who played well over two hundred games, won two league championships, or has moved to a new stadium. I mean, uh, you know, what are your feelings about our current position? I look, I look outside, looking in now, and it just thinks, you know, it's a shame. And like, I know the des- they're so desperate. These Sunderland fans are so desperate for it. You know, I mean, they're urging people to to run their football club. Properly, you know, and everybody will have their, you know, their opinions on it and stuff. Um, and it's difficult because they want to, you know, they want to just get into to the championship first of all. But so I'm just praying that it's all going to knit together. But um, it will be back. It will be back. We all know it's going to be back. It's just a matter of time. But try telling some supporters that now, and they must probably uh, want to give me a little bit of a clip. But it will happen one day. <laughs> Hello, this is former Sunderland player Danny Collins here. This Christmas, we are asking you, the Sunderland fans, to help raise funds for Sunderland Community Soup Kitchen. It's a fantastic charity with the soul of the community at its heart, and they'll be working around the clock this Christmas to make sure hungry people in our city don't go without. You can be certain that your donation, no matter how large or small, will be put to good use to provide help for local people who are in desperate need of it. You can find the links in the description below. Thank you for any help you can give and a Merry Christmas.